it's that time of year again. My humidity sensor says 24% humidity in my office. And if you're designing electronics, that could be problematic because as you're walking around, you build up a little bit of charge and you accidentally touch an input and it fries that input or even more of the circuit. And if you use things like ground pads or proper grounding procedures or just suppression circuits, you can actually prevent that from frying your circuit. But there's a different kind of static hazard and that's what I wanna talk about today, right? A different static hazard specifically with regard to digital logic systems. And so if you paid attention to your digital logic class, you've probably heard about these before. And perhaps maybe you just didn't believe your professor or were suspicious that that would never apply to you. Um, but I want to exemplify it with this circuit here and show you how to fix them. So check it out. I've got this truth table that I put together and this truth table, um, that's, that's where I started. And from my truth table, I went to my Karnam map so I've got two essential prime implicants. I've got A, B, naught, and I've got B, C. And from there, I've got my equation. And from my equation, I built my logic diagram. And I'm not gonna go through every individual state. Instead, I'm just going to look at where the static hazard happens, right? Since I designed the circuit, I had an intention to specify and see if it actually was there, oops. Static hazard, there we go, static hazard. <laughs> um, anyways, there's one specific spot that I wanna look at, and it's the transition from state 111 to 101. So all I really need to do is change my B input from a one to a zero, which is reasonably easy. And I should see my output stay at a one, right? They're both ones. And so now let me show you the circuit diagram or specifically the circuit implementation. So what do we see here? Well, I've got three toggle switches, my A, B, and C going to low pass filters. And then I've got um, some knots, I've got some ands and I've got some ors. And also just behind the scenes, I'm using my not as a part of my debound circuit as well. Um, but let's not get into that. So um, what I need to do to test this circuit out is I just need to change my B from a one to a zero. And I've currently got my oscilloscope showing the output of this circuit. So let's give it a shot. Do you see the blip? Pay attention to the oscilloscope when I switch it. There's a blip, another blip. Every time I switch it, there's a little blip. It doesn't last for long, but it's there. If I wanna capture that, right, and actually look at it with my digital storage oscilloscope, I can put my trigger somewhere in between my range, somewhere in between zero and five, and I can set it to single mode to capture that. And here I'm gonna transition it again. And there it is, we've caught it. This right here is the static hazard, right? And so what we expect to happen, right, is we expect for our output to stay at one for both 101 and 111. But that doesn't happen have this little teeny blip where it goes down to zero and you can see it's actually really noisy during that transition. So um, in a lot of cases this might not be a problem for really slow digital circuits but in high speed things or things that are counting pulses this could be very very problematic. So let's go back to the board and I can show you how to fix this. Your best tool for finding static hazards is to look at your K map. And all you need to do is find the two or find any implicants that share an edge but don't overlap, which is right here. At this transition is where the static hazard hides. And so it's pretty easy to prevent the static hazard from happening by adding a new implicant 
right? We want this implicant to be as big as possible. It still needs to follow all our same rules for making implicants. But we need something to cover this transition between this implicant and this implicant. So let's add that to our system. This is AC. And now let's add it to our circuit. We're going to need A and we're going to need C. And there we go. Now let's go give it a test back at our circuit. So, well actually let's look at the actual circuit first. And this is some of the wiring that I did beforehand. I've already got this other term wired up and ready to test. So let's hook in to our new fixed X. And now we can go to our oscilloscope. And let's run this again. We don't see that blip quite as much anymore. So let's, uh, let's try and do a capture here and see if we can capture it. And there it is. The blip is no longer occurring. So, something we should note is that this is not the simplest circuit, right? Fixing the static hazard does not simplify. In fact, it adds complexity. But that complexity solves problems that we have that we did not want before. Why do static hazards happen? Well, it actually is because of this guy right here. If we kind of think of signal propagation in the way that it goes through here, this not causes B to take a little bit of time to change into B not before it can trigger this AND gate, and this AND gate might be off before this one could turn back on. And that's the simple way of explaining what's happening with static hazards. So, if you're trying to make high precision digital electronics, you have to pay attention to static hazards or throw in other measures to mitigate them.